Grace and peace to all who gather here, and uh, welcome to our Transfiguration Sunday service. Uh, actually, an important uh, moment in the life of our, uh, in our liturgical life, uh, in our Christian life, uh, in which we're really focused on change. Not always something that the church does well, but uh, we're focused today. So welcome to all of you as we cross the threshold this morning, uh, moving from the world outside of there and troubles into a time to be together, uh, a time to heal together, uh, a time to take strength in uh, God's presence and the sense of the holy all around us. So may God open our eyes and our hearts and our ears this morning. Let's join in a call to gather uh, together and uh, shall we be this more light about each other. Light creates understanding. Understanding creates love. Love creates patience, and patience creates unity. Therefore, Therefore we, we gather, gather for worship this day. day. To acknowledge the dazzling light among us, to recognize its power, to expose the past, to affirm God's radiating presence, to heal our wounds today and to be drawn by the flood light that advertises our hope for tomorrow. In love and truth, we shall ascend the mountain together and to share the promise of a brighter future. We come to the willing to gain wisdom and strength, change the world, and live God's transfiguration up close. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, let us worship. Please stand for the gathering hymn as you are able. It will be 3152 in the green. The green. The
children and youth who'd like to come down for our time together. from the clouds even as we speak. Nice background music for Transfiguration Sunday. That works for me. All right. um, so friends, we're going to uh, take a look this morning at this Transfiguration story uh, that is coming to us uh, from the Gospel according to Matthew. And uh, yeah, I'll read it off the screen so Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain to be alone with them. And before their eyes, Jesus was transfigured. I mean, his face became as dazzling as the sun, his clothes as radiant as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with Jesus. And then Peter said, Rabbi, how good that we are here. With your permission, I will erect three shelters here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter was still speaking when suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, overshadowed them and out of the cloud came a 
became a voice, a voice which said, This is my own, my beloved, on whom my favor rests. Listen to him. When they heard this, the disciples fell forward on the ground, overcome with fear. Jesus came toward them, touched them, saying, Get up, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they did not see anyone but Jesus. As they were coming down the mountainside, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone about this until the chosen one has risen from the dead. So in this reading of the gospel this morning, thanks be to God. So, this is kind of a fun text. Several years ago, I was uh, vacationing with some friends we were touring the lands where some of my family's uh, roots are, down kind of in the south, in that kind of four corner uh, area of uh, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia. We were uh, enjoying the scenes. Uh, and uh, as we were sort of going through there, of course, you are struck by um, the Smoky Mountains which is sometimes referred to as uh, uh, Smoky Mountain National Park. But don't confuse that with the fact that it's really the Cherokee Forest. 655,000 acres of just that forest, and around it attached to some other tribal forests as well. Humongous. And you will, of course, recognize the famous smoke in Smoky Mountains. Majestic, kind of mysterious, it is. But the truth of the matter is, the scene is also pure science. Hydrocarbons, uh, those uh, volatile uh, organic compounds, water droplets that kind of uh, fuse from the trees to create what is essentially a kind of mist and fog. But being in the midst of it, Touring it, kind of thinking about ancestors, I also was sort of struck by the timelessness of this fog and a really holy adventure. Now, you know, at the time of the, of the biblical transfiguration story, uh, science was yet an explanation for much of anything. Clouds were just revelatory. Clouds on mountaintops were kind of the front porch, uh, kind of the front, front porch of the house of heaven. If you stood on your tippy toes and peered through the window to the divine, you could see and, and you could hear the voice of God more clearly, which is why people went to mountaintops. This seems to be somewhat the case here in Matthew's telling of the transfiguration story. story uh, a story, by the way, that appears in all three of the synoptic gospels. A story that, uh, that tells us something about Jesus. So, let's take a look this morning at just what we find out about Jesus from Matthew. First, he says, it's six days after, and perhaps you were curious as I was, six days after what? Well, it says six days after Jesus had shared some rather uncomfortable and unforgettable, I would guess if I was a disciple hearing this, unforgettable news from Jesus. And that is, we're going to Jerusalem, um, and there we can expect trouble. We can expect suffering and death, but also a resurrection. Six days earlier, Jesus had shared this news. But the days ahead were going to be difficult. They would, they would be hard. And that this was kind of a moment, a kind of spiritual retreat, in a sense, with them for the spiritual advance that was to come. Second, they're on a mountain. Of course they are. Which is, where else can you hear that, right? And third, as it turns out, the three disciples and Jesus are not alone. They are joined by Elijah and Moses. Of course they were. Here's two of the guys, two guys, two, two 
mountain people from the Hebrew scriptures that have these kind of ecstatic kind of mountain experiences. In fact, some people think it's kind of on that mountain and that experience that they, in fact, uh, transfer, walk through the door, uh, died to this world, and entered the nerds. If you remember, it was Moses who spent how many days? Numbers in the story are really, really, really important. He spent six days on uh, Mount Nebur, where he was, in fact, uh, received the, the Ten Commandments uh, in the story, made covenant uh, with God. Um, and so it was six days earlier, six days under. So Matthew's trying to draw these connections to talk about Jesus as, of course, the one we're supposed to follow. He, he fits all of the bill. But it's also the case that Matthew is painting here you know, they say a you know, picture's worth a thousand words, and since it's a relatively short sermon, we're going to go with the picture here. But, um, but in Matthew's picture, his portrait of this, uh, we have another kind of Hebrew mystery number. Uh, mystery numbers are those numbers like 3, 6, 10, 7, 12. Um, they're numbers that say to us that whenever you hear that, you should listen closely because it means that there's something much, 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 much greater and more going on. There's, there's a holy presence around uh, these numbers. It's just kind of part of the, the, the creation of human narrative. So um, here's the case in which he has these, these three. He has the, the one who is the epitome of the law, Moses, the one who is the epitome of the prophets, Elijah, the uh, Prophets and the law now completed from Matthew's perspective in Jesus. That just as God had created the world in six days, so also all of this has happened in God's six days, and now there is this completion for Matthew in Jesus uh, on the seventh day. Now is the beginning of the new creation. Now, that's a lot, you know. For, uh, for us to overhear in this text. And, and it was even a bigger, I believe, a bigger ordeal for the disciples, the witnesses who were experiencing this close up and personal. Peter, of course, wants to uh, institutionalize this experience. Of course he does. He's Peter. This is the guy who's supposed to be the rock, and he's supposed to go on and sort of, uh, you know, be this foundation of this institutional church. But you know, Jesus really is really, on his way to Jerusalem, doesn't have much time for institutionalizing uh, holy movements. By the time the cloud is rolling in here and is relaying God's word, this is my beloved. Um, listen to him. This is the one with whom I'm well pleased. This is the one I've chosen to sort of speak my. And as that cloud rolls in, they're all there, um, sure that they are in the presence of the Holy One. And the disciples, who are a little out of their league at this point, fall on their face, it says in the text, fall on their face, frightened, shaking by what they are experiencing. Now, I kind of like this text because it proves that we've been singing that great communion song all wrong. You know that verse about when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun? I always sing when I fall on my face with my knees to the rising sun. That's kind of the example, kind of, kind of the experience rather that these uh, disciples are having. But then, seriously, then, the most tender, one of the most favorite parts of the story for me, so many times overlooked in its preaching and totally missed in the Gospels of Mark and Luke who tell the story. Suddenly, Jesus notices how badly shaken they are. And he walks over. And he touches them. Jesus comes to them. He had to have bowed down to touch them because they were already flat on the ground themselves. And, and he touches them. It's deeply personal. It's, it's deeply compassionate. Holy tender. And he says to them, Hey guys, get up. Don't be afraid. Now, 
He might have said, Hey, gird up your big boy loins, loincloths. You know, get out. But it was very tender. Come on, guys. Get out. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of God. And then the story goes on. On the way down the mountain, he tells them, as is recorded in uh, other places in the scriptures, this kind of messianic secret, which suggests the secret is don't tell anybody what just happened here until after I've been resurrected. Which I think for me says something not only of that tender touch, but also a Jesus who's lacking in self-aggrandizement and self-promotion. I mean, he's not the guy with the slick hair on television, right? Uh, collecting big bucks, uh, etc., telling the gospel. Rather, Jesus is this kind of humble, regular, bearer of holiness, who's teaching us not to, you know, look to great personalities, etc., but that God is in the common uh, and in the order. Well, at this point, the holy tour is over in the mountain, and they're heading back down, and it's back to duty. Duty calls, back to the village below, where they're going to encounter, you know, just right off the experience, a boy who's epileptic, and uh, whose father wants him to be healed, and on for teaching and confrontation with others, etc. as Jesus marches towards Jerusalem to confront the empire. So you might want to ask yourself, why does Matthew tell us to start? Why did Mark and Luke include it as well? Why is it so doggone important in our Christian life, our historical and liturgical life, our holy time in the world? I think it's because Matthew knows that the road ahead is bumpy at best. If what Jesus had said six days ago is in fact true, that there will be suffering and death and resurrection, which by the way is not resuscitation and it's more than life beyond death. If so, in Jerusalem they will discover in the days to come the reality also of a new creation. If they can hold on, they will discover and taste a new creation experience a beloved community even in the midst of their difficulties. This story is that grounding. It's that power to survive the future. And why is it important for the Christian community to even keep telling that story today? Well, in light of Black History Month, I'm reminded of the power of mountain stories, the way in which they ground us for difficult days ahead. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached what ended up being his last sermon, April 3rd, 1968, at the Bishop Charles Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee. It was, as you will remember, in the midst of the sanitation worker strike. The storm was raging, they say, outside that night. Uh, and it was more than just a few clouds. It was the winds of change that were whipping up and scaring a lot of privileged people across the land. Threats to his life thundered, and the lightning that would take his life was getting closer. And that night, the night before he would be struck down by an assassin, he was one of those mountain people. In fact, he, in this sermon, which I invite you to go back and read, uh, in this sermon, he kind of takes a tour of mountaintop experiences in history, right? You know, he says, I, you know, I want to go to Egypt. I want to be on the mountaintop. And 
And, and, but I'm not satisfied there. I'm going to go on. I want to go to Mount Olympus, and I want to talk to Aristotle and the rest of them. And I'm not settled there. I want to go on. I want to go on. Higher and higher. It's quite a tour. But then he presented the call to duty to all those who had gathered. He told us that black Americans, uh, their collective annual income exceeded in 1968, it exceeded $30 billion a year. That was more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada in the hands of the black community. Now that had to set off light bulbs for folks who sitting in the pew. Might even set up a few light bulbs for anybody sitting in the pews today. That he told them was real power, not automatic weapons. But the real power was what he called for that night. Stop buying Coca-Cola. That's a big thing in the South, right? Stop buying Seal Test. Stop buying Wonder Bread. He called them to divest in white businesses and invest in white or in, in black-owned banks and credit unions and, and business insurance businesses and the like. Divest from the businesses that wouldn't get out of the way of justice and invest in those who can make it happen. That's a pretty powerful speech. To me, the power of rifles and bombs and violence, that was Caesar's game. Just the power of an organized and united economic front for the good, for the common good. At the end of the speech, he referenced the attacks that had come against his life. He shared that they had been, you know, in, in trouble when they left Atlanta that morning. That, uh, that in fact, uh, the pilot had come over and said, sorry for this delay and taking off, but we have Martin Luther King Jr. and some of his uh, entourage on board, and we have to check everything thoroughly just to make sure that the flight's not been set. He referenced the fact that uh, all day and before in his coming, there was news spreading throughout uh, Memphis um, that uh, he better be careful because violence was brewing. And then he concluded, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And God's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, I've seen the promise. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried, afraid of anything. I'm not fearing any. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. We tell this story of that transfiguration tour not just because it happened to Jesus and gave clarity to him, power, comfort, and assurance for the days of passion that he would face to him. As he went to Jerusalem, or not just for the assurance of that early church who would face their own difficulties and torture for the sake of truth. But we tell it today because it is our truth. It is our 
clarity, our certainty, our certainty, our, our blessed assurance as we address the struggles and duties of our own day. As you may be struggling right now trying to figure out how to make ends meet. You may be struggling now in a relationship. How to make it work. You may be facing a difficult diagnosis and an even more difficult protocol. You may be facing an addiction in a very serious way and are experiencing a kind of life-sucking anguish that upends you. You may need to be the whistleblower at work. You may need to take a stand that runs against the grain of your family and friends. Man, just got through Christmas. Now we got Easter coming up. You may be facing what it will mean to stand up for justice. Well, this is our story, and this is our song. We stand in awe of the Holy One Jesus, whose transfiguration models for us change the world, a change that's possible, a, a vision and a clarity and an assurance that we're going to make it, that God is with us and we're going to make it, that there will still be plenty of good times, but there are also going to be difficult days, and we are going to make it because in life and death and life beyond death, God is with us. <coughs> so don't be afraid. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Beloved, I always want to refer you back to your uh, announcements that come out to you just to be reminded of not only the many meetings, which is the way in which we gather together and do work to make good things happen in this world and build beloved community, but also for those things that we still gather from our abundance uh, uh, to give to. And so please remember our community fridge uh, across, uh, across the street. And uh, also still collecting items uh, for uh, immigrants. Uh, as you've heard in the news, we have people who are getting uh, settled and sometimes in very difficult places. Um, uh, throughout our metropolitan area, but not only here, but in other uh, places as well. And uh, to remember, we're keeping your prayers, our friends, our friends at Olivet United Methodist Church. I, I'm not sure we finally got the fix uh, on that furnace over there yet, uh, but we are very, very, very close uh, to making that happen. So mindful of uh, all of those many opportunities listed here, those in your announcements those you're aware of uh, in your own communities. Uh, let us here together right now make a commitment. Here we not only sing, pray, and preach for a new heaven on earth, but we put our tithes and our pledges where our hearts are, and then we recommit to a just economy of the world. How should we receive our offering this morning?
as we gather this morning, we do want to be mindful um, that we've committed ourselves when we join this church uh, to pray for one another, and that that is a, a holy privilege um, that, uh, that we want to hold on to. It. The many weeks of illness here of members of our congregation and difficulties, I can't remember the, I mean, I, I can't uh, recount all of the times I've heard uh, people talk about how important it was to know that they were being prayed for, how important it was for people to send cards and text, etc., uh, to let them know uh, that uh, as a community, whether they're here or not, as a community, we hold one another uh, in prayer. And so we are people of all ages who uh, enter this space, bringing our joys and our concerns. In the light and beauty of short days, we give thanks in awe and wonder. In the dark and stillness of long nights, we, we dream of healing and hope. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So let us light our pure candle as we remember uh, in this silence all of those who uh, are on our prayer. So then let us pray. Let us offer our prayers for ourselves, for those named or remembered in our hearts and in our e blasts And also let us remember all of those who do not have the freedom to express their concern or celebration. And may we be ever mindful of the presence of the sacred among us, and so see the new possibilities of the world. So let us join all of our prayers this morning in the prayer that Jesus taught us, calling on God in ways that bring God closest to us, and in the language of our hearts. And so we pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the Lord. Pastor CJ will come and lead us in our Eucharistic uh, ritual this morning. Uh, please note that we're using 2257 in the Faith We Sing. If you're looking for the music, otherwise, otherwise the words will be on the wall. Friends, as we gather at this table, we are all trans today. Brothers and sisters and siblings, this is the mighty feast, the joyful feast, the holy feast of and for the people of God. This table represents a level of welcome, inclusion, and imagery which can only be experienced through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We have shared in mind-blowing trips up holy mountains and in ventures down into the valleys of our common life. With all the saints above and the saints below, we are challenged here to build the beloved community on earth. Repaired, renewed, redeemed, we will find the collective strength and wisdom to overcome evil with good and to overcome death with life. And in joyful anticipation of that day, how can we keep from singing? and our greatest joy to give thanks to you, O God, of freedom and power. For you have called forth the creation and raised us from dust by your rupa. We bless you for the beauty and the bounty by which each of us was wonderfully made, and for the power to shake off the fetters of anything that mars this beauty. We thank you for the spirit of resistance, for Moses and Jael, for the righteous that revoke, that remove the yoke, for angels that roll away the stones, for those who try not once, but twice, to not only cross a bridge, but to build a bridge, for those who made abolition, civil rights, and racial justice a reality. Above all, we give thanks to you, O God, for the gift of Jesus, your Son and our Savior, who resisted the empire, bore the cross, and rose up among us, continuing to this day to inspire our work for diversity, justice, and peace. Because we are thankful, we sing. We sing your highest praises in one voice with the company of our ancestors who paved the way. Remember Jesus, who gathered one last time around a table with those he called family. Mindful of the consequences of those who cause good trouble, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to those who had gathered, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of God's love, poured out for all as a sign of forgiveness and grace. And whenever you eat and drink, do this in memory of me. And so, in remembrance, 
of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, O oh God, we now proclaim the mystery of our faith. Gracious God, pour out your spirit on all gathered here and at home, and on these gifts of the bread and cup. May they be signs of your presence and our opportunity to receive you into our lives and to live your life into the future. At this moment, we invite you to unseal your sacraments, and we will partake together. The bread of the new heaven, broken for you. The cup of eternal love shed for you. And now let us pray together. We give thanks, holy God, for in this holy Eucharist, we have become aware of your love at work in us, growing and birthing the new heaven on earth, in life, in death, in life beyond death. Christ is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Friends, our scattering hymn can be found in the Red Hymnal, number 533, but I have a hunch you all know it. Let us stand together and sing, We Shall Overcome.
Amen. Before we join in the words of scattering, we just say that this service actually ends Epiphany. It reminds us all that Lent starts, and it starts this Wednesday. This is Ash Wednesday coming up. We'll have a service be in the Wesley Room at 7 o'clock as we start this uh, special time together. Uh, and uh, we study and reflect on, uh, well, looking for love in all the wrong places. Uh, and so our theme for this uh, time of Lent, uh, we will also have a service at Grove Park Arms at uh, 9 o'clock, uh, the morning of Ash Wednesday. Um, and uh, want to enjoy, add, invite you to join us uh, online uh, as well. So then, these words from Harriet Tubman. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Success to be, is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which they have overcome while trying to succeed. Go to love and serve the present age. In loving and serving, we shall find our